No, you can keep it open. You can kind of take notes if you wanted to. Um, all right, Angel. Sierra. was the uh, homework? I got to thinking last night, last night or, or early this morning. Um, I think what I'm going to need to do is make a document of the common error messages that we see. So that way, you know, you email me, I can say, check the document. Because uh, especially early on, we get the same, we're going to get the same same error messages. Uh, so I'm going to see what I can do uh, and maybe I'll see what I can do maybe over the weekend and then maybe have it posted on Wednesday that you can look through and, and we can add then maybe any additional error messages that pop up. It's like the, the one is like error in like pain doc. You know, binary file it means your word template's not in that same folder. Or when you download it, it's, it's a different name. So Maybe I can I can put something together like that, uh, just to help help us. So I didn't check. Did you upload it just fine? Upload the PDF. All right. Did you, anyone have issues with knitting? Well, I know we've had some issues. You didn't get it knitted yet? No. Okay. What's your what's your error message? Okay.
homework is uh, after class, sometime after class. I don't even know, maybe 5 o'clock, 3 o'clock, who knows. Uh, we can, I can help after class and get the rest of the, the, uh, the errors resolved. All right, so in the meantime, let's move on. So uh, this part is going to introduce a lot of definitions. Uh, definitions are a big part of any field. You have to learn the terminology. Uh, in order to have intelligent conversations. And in this class, you have to know the terminology because that terminology will help you decide what test to run to analyze your data. All right, so we're going to hit up uh, data and biology. We'll talk about samples, we'll talk about data, we'll talk about populations, and then we'll move on to descriptive statistics. Uh, on that open textbook on OpenStax, this is in chapters one and two. All right. So there's two main fields to statistics. Uh, and remember, statistics is all about collection, analyzing, and interpreting the data. So there's descriptive statistics and there's inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics is all about organ organizing and summarizing the data. This is all about just collecting the data and then presenting it in some way. So be it a, a graph of some type, be it a table, all right, maybe it's just verbalizing. The information, so stating the means, stating standard errors, and so forth, um, because the numerical descriptions are what we're we're targeting. This is what we're trying to present, right? The descriptions, numerical descriptions, the examples, right? You know, vary. The ones we'll talk about in class, we'll focus on the means, we'll focus on the medians, we'll focus on variance and standard errors, and, and so forth. Ranges, a little bit. Uh, you've probably encountered ranges back in elementary school. Inferential statistics goes beyond just the numerical descriptions. Inferential statistics is all about utilizing our data uh, to make predictions about processes and also to draw conclusions about underlying processes that might have produced those data. So can I go both ways? We collect the data and we use it to make the descriptions, then utilize that to make predictions, or we have our idea of how a process might work, let's collect the data and see if our data reflect those processes. So both of those are inferential statistics. All right, with uh, this inferential statistics, we can assign a confidence level to our conclusion. So we either have low confidence, uh, which means the conclusions are probably wrong, but they could be correct, or we'll have high confidence uh, which means, yeah, we're probably correct, but there is a chance that, that, that we're wrong. Right? We always try to strive for that high confidence level um, whenever we're doing inferential statistics. Now, inferential statistics relies on probability theory. To really properly do this type of statistics, you need to know some math. You need to at least have an understanding of, of the math. So what's probability? Probability is simply uh, the likelihood that an event occurs. All right, this is, if we flip a coin, what's the chance that it comes up head? Well, it's two outcomes, so we have a 50-50, a 50% chance of heads, 50% chance of tails. All right, to kind of come up with that probability distribution, Carl Pearson flipped a coin 24,000 times to kind of to demonstrate the variation that we can get. And he, out of this, these 24,000 times, he obtained 12,012 heads. Pretty darn close to that 50-50. Notice it's not exactly 12,000, but that's because we have random chance. We have uh, just stochasticity. That's just as an FYI. Uh, can you imagine doing that 24,000 times? I wonder how long it took him to do this. Or rather, I wonder if he actually had a group of graduate students that were doing it for him, and then he refused to put their names on the paper. That's also a possibility. All right. So with our statistics, we are going to be working with samples, and we typically utilize these samples to make predictions about the population. Our population is 
the universe. Right? That is everything in our universe. We can define it as the totality of individual observations about which inferences are to be made, existing anywhere in the world, or at least within a definitely specified sampling area, limited in both space and time. All right, so it could be the entire universe that's out there, or we could confine it to very specific place, very specific time. All right. How we define that population really just comes down to the group that we're interested in making predictions about. All right, so if we're looking at these black beetles that are walking around, they're all over. All right, if we're interested in describing population, you know, sizes of these black beetles, or I'll say we're interested in, in describing the walking speeds of these beetles, all right, we are, you know, what would be our population? Well, if we did the entire Earth, we'd have to go out and pick up samples all across the entire Earth so that we can make a prediction about it. But if we confine our collecting to just this building, then we're going to collect these individuals just from this building. And that way, our population then is black beetles in Cadmus. There's one right now, right? Walking speed. In time, you see how, how fast it moves. Right? So it's our study group, and we have the freedom to pick what our study group is. Once we figure out what group we want, that determines our sampling regime, and that's kind of what we were talk what I'm talking about. We can have our sampling regime could be all of this building, all right? Or maybe we're only interested in the basement, so then we only sample in the basement. So we want to make sure that where we collect, we're getting a random sample across all of the area where our defined population can be. Our individuals, or is this part of this population, could refer to the individuals itself like, like these beetles, or it could actually be experiments. So you might be thinking, well, how does this apply to you know, some of the uh, bacterial ex experiments, so the antibiotic resistance screens that perhaps Dr. Crable runs, or you know, some of the virus studies that, that, that perhaps Dr. Uh, Kokonis runs. Well, it's not all of the viruses, but we could define our populations as all the experiments. And you kind of have to think in an abstract sense to say that Dr. Crable runs, let's say, 10 plates. Right? Those 10 plates represent the sample of all of the possible experiments that he could run. He could go back and run 24,000 plates if he wanted to. Right? But you don't. You take a smaller sample. So don't think just in terms of the population, just in terms of being an organism, an individual. You can think of it as a set of experiments. And that's why we oftentimes do multiple replicates to increase uh, or to reduce the amount of stochastic variation that we have in our data. So with that, most of our populations are finite. But we typically assume them to be infinite. Right, so our population of, of beetles here is assumed to be infinite in this building, even though we know there's an upper limit. That's, we don't have 10 billion of them in here because we wouldn't be able to walk around. All right. But that makes it useful for us because if we assume to be, if we assume that our population is infinite, then the, the chance of getting any one number is going to be really, really small, which means as we increase our, our sample size, our value should kind of focus on our central tendency, should focus on our mean, our median, and so forth. So there's there's a lot of like statistical uh, or probability, uh, probability consequences of making this assumption. All right. So whenever we make our numerical descriptors, say mean, variance, standard deviation, median, and so forth, and we make those descriptors at the level of the population, we refer to those as parameters. All right? We, we refer to those as parameters. Samples are used to make the inferences on the population, and it's because it's totally unlikely that we could obtain every single object or every single individual in that population, or that we could do every single possible experiment out there to get our entire range of variation. Reasons, 
too time consuming, can't catch them, you know, you won't see them, not enough money to do this stuff, reasons, reasons vary. But our goal is to get a sample that allows us to make predictions about that population. And this is where our sampling regime becomes very important. In order to make those inferences, we have to have what is called a random sample. All right, a random sample is a sample where the frequencies of each sample equals the true frequencies in our population. So the best way we can, we can talk about it is if we had a bag of marbles, all right, we had red, red marbles, white marbles in, inside of them. All right, let's say 75% red, 25% white. All right, and let's say there's a million marbles. And what we're trying to do is estimate what, what the percentage of red, red and white are. If we collect a random sample, we're sticking our hand in and randomly pulling out marbles and maybe pull out, let's say, 100. The probability of pulling out any one ball is the same, regardless of its color. As long as that holds, then when we look at our sample, we now have a random sample, and whatever frequency of red we have in that sample could be used to estimate the actual population uh, proportion in, in that bag of marbles. All right. So if we hold this to be true, then it's not just called a random sample, it's a representative sample. And then from here, we can derive our, our, our numerical descriptors. They're no longer called parameters. They're now called sample statistics. And these are the ones that you're probably most, most used to calculating and utilizing. All right, how do we generate our random samples from our population? A couple different ways. One way, if we know the entire population, we just assign each individual number and then randomly draw them. So here's an example. We want to measure the diameter of oak trees. Or we want to know what is the average diameter, the mean diameter of oak trees on this campus. All right. And we say, and let's say we have 10 minutes to do it. 10 minutes to go out, measure, uh, measure a sample and come back. So the question is, how do we, we don't have enough time to go measure all oaks on campus. And I'll give you like a map and say, here's one, here's one, I've numbered them for you. All right, you don't have enough time to do that. So you have to select a sample of oak trees to measure that should approximate the population. Since I numbered all of these individuals, before you go out, you just say, okay, we have 100 oak trees on campus. They're all numbered. Let's go through and pick 10 of them, randomly pick 10 of them. And that serves as our random sample. And you would get that. It's a random sample. The probability that you go out and, and measure that tree is the same as the probability of measuring any other tree in that group. That's one way. Usually, though, you don't have the entire population. You don't know where everyone is. You, you can't collect them. So at that point, we have to do a couple different things, or we can do a couple different things. One of them is to kind of generate a map on, on the computer, or just kind of sketch out the area, and then have the computer randomly pick points. And then at those points, you establish a grid. And in that grid, that's who you count. So we've taken random points across the landscape, and hopefully we've collected enough to satisfy our sample size requirements. That's our grid method. The other method is we pick a point out in that spot, and then we randomly select a direction and proceed along a straight line, taking measurements on everything, let's say, within an arm's width of that line. Again, we're generating a random point of collection, or random points of collection, in our landscape with the idea that we will randomly sample from our population. Move this. This is actually pretty important for us. Video covers this box. Our ability to do good stats depends on how we sample our population. We need to have a good random sample. If we don't, a lot of our conclusions will be wrong. Some of our numerical descriptors will be wrong. Not that you screwed up calculating the mean, but that they don't adequately reflect our population. All right, so our random sample, once we go out and collect our random sample, it's going to consist of observations. 
we're going to have two types. We have an individual observation. We have a sample of observation. Our individual observation is a data point. It is a single item. It could be the diameter of the oak tree. It could be a wing length of the single roach. It could be the movement speed of, the, of that black beetle that was walking across the floor. It's an observation or measurement taken on the smallest sampling unit. And our smallest sampling unit would be the individual at that point. The sample of observation is the collection of all of our individual observations. So we go through and measure the speed of those black beetles for, all, for 20 of the beetles that we catch in, the, in the, the building. Each speed, or each beetle has a speed. That's our individual observation. The collection of 20 is our sample of observations. Other terms for that, that's what we, we would refer to as our sample. That's our data set. That's our data. In R, that would be our data frame. All right, well, if our data, it would be at least one column in our data frame, our, our measurement column. All right. So normally when we refer to our sample, we're talking about the sample of observations. That's typically what, what we're talking about. Now each of our observations consists of a single measurement or at attribute variable. We're only going to have one thing, so length of the wing. That's, that's one variable. All right. Speed, that's one variable. If we measure more than one variable on the individual, all right, we don't have multiple individual observations observations because our smallest sampling unit is the roach itself. So our roach then is our, our individual sampling unit. Our speed of our, of our, not our, our beetle, it, not our roach, it's our beetle. The speed of that beetle, that's going to give us one variable. And then we could have, let's say, leg length, maybe length of the tarsus matters or whatever. All right, so what's our variable? The variable that we measure, that's our character. That's the actual property that's measured by our individual observations. So speed, wing length, and, and, and so forth. A typical data set in, in R has a single variable per column. All right. I say typical, and this is going to apply in Excel too. I say typical because that's how you should create your, your data tables. That's how you should enter in your data into Excel. You should always do that. But the exception is if you're going to use Excel to make figures, you tend to have, oftentimes you have to break that rule in order to, to get the figures to, to look proper. Uh, in R, it's not the case. We need one column per variable. Very important spot. And more than one variable can come from the small sampling unit. Right. Wing lengths, left wing, right wing. Two variables, All right. same individual. How do we key that into R? Wing length, that's our one variable. All right. Then we have a second variable, which would be a nominal variable. That specifies if that measurement is the left wing or the right. So you have another like classification, left versus right. Same thing if we did heights, height, height of class. Right. The height is our measurement variable. That's one column. And then if we broke it down by sex, um, you know, male, female, that would be a second column with that separation. That's how we read it into R. That's how you should set it up. Uh, and again, if you're only doing things in Excel, we might have to break that rule. What's the implication of the small sampling unit? No problem if we only take one me measurement per individual. If we take more than one measurement per individual, what we end up doing is violating one of our major assumptions, which is our, our variables are independent. So you're going to see this, this assumption uh, for all of our tests. I'm trying to think. Are they all, all of our tests? Almost all of our tests. When we get, we'll get to, we should get to correlation. Those tests are measuring the, the lack of independence. At least that's our, that's our goal. Anyways. But our t-test, ANOVA, and so forth. Our major assumption, variables are not independent. But if we have more than one variable and we're trying to analyze them together you know, in one statistical test, we violate that assumption. Are there ways to fix it? Yep, there are. Plenty of different ways to fix it. All right. 
just briefly, sometimes you might run across a bivariate sample. What does that mean? It means we violated independence because we took two measurements on the same individual, uh, and that gives us paired observations. Uh, exercise, heart rates before and after exercise. We can do that. You'll see, uh, my, I, I'm trying to remember when the human, human and the man in the environment has their lab, if it's on Monday afternoon or not. If it is, we'll see them at some point. We'll hear them because they're supposed to like take their, their heart rate and then I think run down the hall, run up the stairs, run down the hall, run down the stairs, and then they take it again. Violated independence. Because in theory, if you have a naturally high heart rate and then you exercise, your heart rate should be even higher than everyone else. So it kind of scales. So bivariate sample are those where you have your paired observations. So as a summary, we've got sample statistics. Those are the statistics from our sample. We're going to utilize those to make predictions or to make inferences about our population parameters. All right? If our sample is a random sample, then we can make this inference of our population. All right? Where did we get our sample? We drew our sample from our population. So you can kind of see how things are related. The other aspect is our sample statistics utilize normal, I'm going to say, English letters. All right? English letters for this uh, to represent their sample statistics. So. Uh, the letter with the bar over top represents our, our average or our mean. S is our standard deviation. R is our uh, correlation. D is typically a difference. Uh, P is our correlation coefficient, oftentimes. I said R is our correlation. P is our proportion, uh, proportion probability. Our population parameters would be referenced as the Greek symbols. All right, so mu is our, is our averages, is our mean. So there's our mu. Sigma represents the population standard deviation. Rho represents our correlation. Delta is our difference. And then pi represents our percentages, our proportions. All right. Questions on samples and populations. All right. So let's talk about variables. Now that you know samples and, and populations and how we, we utilize samples to make predictions on, about the populations, uh, now we need to talk about the variables. When we're interested in doing our measurements, and doing an experiment, we need to select a variable whose property is going to differ in some measurable way. Right, that's always our goal. Why? Because we have to have some ability to detect differences and to measure those differences. Right? If everything's the same, if we're doing heights, if we're trying to measure heights and we're measuring it to the nearest meter, all right, we're going to have, you know, I don't, we don't have anyone, well, I don't know, Tanner's pretty tall. We might not have anyone that, that exceeds, you know, let's say two, two meters, especially if we round up, I guess. So, you know, there's no variation. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't choose that. So once we figure out what variable we're going to measure, we have to figure out what type of variable it is. Right? So we can have a qualitative variable, or we can have a quantitative variable. Qualitative variables are non-numeric data that are expressed with their attributes. Uh, they're also called categorical variables. They're called nominal variables. They, they can include ordinal variables. Right? Examples of this would be hair color, or sex, or nationality. All, right. all of these are just attributes. That's all they are. They're qualitative. Nothing's really measured. All right. They're often presented in combination with frequencies. So we can say a certain frequency has brown hair, a certain frequency has red hair, and so forth. All right. And with those frequencies, then, we can present them as a figure in a, like a bar graph, or we can make a table which would be a frequency or uh, an enumeration table, which just shows us our counts. Quantitative variables are those that are completely expressed numerically. So I'm going to say the qualitative variables, sometimes we can rekey them to, to express them numerically, but those numbers actually represent an attribute. With the quantitative variables, the numbers actually have a numerical meaning. All right? 
to actually have a numerical meaning. The 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 actually means that 5 is larger than 1. Whereas if we rekey these in numbers, 5 isn't greater than 4. It could be less than 4. You know, there's no order. There's no you know, magnitude, direction, or anything. So with our quantitative variables, we're talking about numbers, measurement variables of some, of some type, measurement or count data. Of those, we have continuous variables and discrete variables. Discrete variables are, are the easier ones to, to represent. These values are limited to a very specific uh, state. There's no intermediate value possible. Typically, these are whole numbers uh, because we, you know, counts. Counts going out there and counting uh, how many leaves are on a bush. That's a discrete variable. You can't have half a leaf. You could, but you don't count. If you look at clutch size, how many offspring individuals have? You can't have half an offspring. It's either an offspring or no offspring. All right, so those are discrete variables. They're also, you may see them uh, listed as discontinuous or meristic. All right, I just use discrete variables. All right, continuous variables are those, those numbers, those those measurement variables that can take any value between two fixed points. And that means we can have an infinite number of possibilities. All right. We have an infinite number of possibilities for measuring height in this class. And you could say, well, hold on. We're, we don't because it's going to be 60 inches, 60 and a half, 60 and a quarter. But I'm going to change that to decimal and say we can do 60.1. 60.01, 60.0001, all the way. All of those, those zeros, those decimal points, means that you can have an infinite number of possibilities. We typically don't have those in our data set because we round our numbers. All right? So you kind of have to think, can I have an infinite number of possibilities? If I had an unlimited ability to keep zooming in to get, get more and more decimal places, and you can do that then you're likely working with the continuous variable. All right, you're likely working with the continuous variable. I also want to point out that uh, we, they can be between two fixed points. So a probability ranges from 0 to 1. All right, that probability is a continuous variable. We're just bounded by 0 and 1. All right, heights. Or, uh, you know, yeah, heights, we're bounded by 0. We can't have a negative height. And in actuality, if you think about it, when you're born, there's going to be like a minimum height of something that's born. I don't know, an inch? What's the smallest fetus that has ever been born? So we're bounded by the smallest fetus in the world, smallest. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, yeah, in theoretically, you know, theoretically speaking, you could have a 100-foot individual. Do, do, do we ever approach that? No. So we are, so in some cases, we fix, fix our points. Um... With our continuous variables, we do we typically display them as a histogram, you know, for a figure, or we use something called a box and whiskers plot uh, that will show the median, our quartiles, uh, our our ranges, and, and so forth. And then we'll we'll learn how to make these, and we'll discuss each of these uh, these figures throughout throughout the class. I will note. Continuous and discrete variables uh, and the effect of rounding. All right. So you may have, you know, we, we may do heights in centimeter and cut it, leave it at that. So then you look at the data frame and you see centimeters and they're all whole numbers. All right. Just because they're all whole numbers doesn't make them a discrete variable. All right. They may have been converted to what looks like a discrete variable just because of rounding. Now, why worry about these? Why worry about these, these classifications? Because it's because the classification tells us what types of tests are available to us. All right? We can't run the same tests on both a continuous variable and a qualitative variable. It's just not possible. So as we get to the stage of what test should we use, the very first thing we have to do is, is, is ask, okay, how many variables do we have? That's, that's our first thing. Once we know the number of variables, then we have to ask, what type of variables are those? And then the type, of, the type and the number of variables that we have then leads to the next question, okay, is there an independent variable and a dependent variable 
And if so, what's, which is which? And then that information says, okay, once we know that, then we have these tests available and these types of questions, uh, or we have these types of que these questions available and so forth. So you'll see, uh, I think some people will panic a little bit, but later on in the class, as we have, as we start adding more and more tests, we're going to do this flow chart and say, okay, you start here and you just go one by one until you get to the, like the type of question that you want to, you want to answer. And here's our options. These are the options that we have. And then once you have those options, then, then you run the test. All right. So that's our variable type, qualitative versus quantitative. There's also a scale, a measurement scale, or a scale of measure. All right. This also can play a role in choosing of our tests. And really, choosing of our tests comes down to giving us an idea of if assumptions of that test will be violated. All right. So with the scale of measurement, we know the type of, of, of variable, so qualitative versus quantitative. And then we have to look at the scale as a, as a predictor of whether or not we violate assumptions. So there's four types. I'm going to make it easy. These first two types all deal with qualitative variables. So if you're a qualitative variable, you're one of these. You're either a nominal variable or an ordinal variable. Both of them describe their attributes. The difference is in the ordering. Is there a natural or is there an implied ordering to that? All right. So most, like, most of our qualitative variables are nominal. There is no implied ordering whatsoever. Some of them, like a Likert scale, who knows what a Likert scale is? Yeah, yeah. It, it, you've all, if you, I assume you've all filled out at least one IDEA evaluation, right? I assume you have you filled out at least one or a customer survey satisfaction card. You know, how satisfied are you? You know, one to five. That's a, that's that is ordinal because you've you've ordered those numbers in a way where one is completely disagree and, and ten is completely agree and so forth. And there's in between. The difference in that ordinal in that ranking scheme for ordinal variable and interval and ratio is that the difference between our numbers isn't constant. So how you judge between a three and a four could be different. The change from a three to a four could be different than the change from an eight to a nine. All right. So an example that I give is that we've used, I've used these ordinal, this ordinal scale to judge pathology in chickens. So we, we would utilize chickens, infect them with avian influenza, and then you'd monitor their symptoms. Zero was no symptoms. All right. One was a moderate symptom. They, they, you know, looked maybe, you know, excess phlegm, excess, you know, watery eyes or something like that. Uh, two, they're lethargic. All right. They, they don't really run when you go to reach into their cage. You know, they just kind of sit there. Three is they're unable to move. They're, they're showing twitching. And like four is death. So how do you judge the difference between a zero and a one and a one and a two? We know severity increases as our number is increased, but we don't really have that magnitude. That's really what is separating ordinal versus our quantitative variables. Because once we get down to the interval and ratio, now the difference from 1 to a 2 is 1 unit. The difference from a 4 to a 5, it's 1 unit. The difference from 9 to a 10 is 1 unit. It's a constant change. All right? So nominal and ordinal, those are all qualitative. Interval and ratio are quantitative. These are our measurement variables. Interval scale is a continuous variable on an arbitrary scale that lacks a meaningful zero point. And that meaningful zero point is the key difference. All right? It lacks a mean. It, if you have, you know, temperatures in, let's say, Fahrenheit or Celsius, right? You've got a zero. Is that a meaningful zero? Because it doesn't give us a, a definitive starting place. All right. 
So here, here's, here's the example, and this is where our difference between ratio and interval lies, and it's in that meaningful zero. You're at, it's 10 degrees Celsius out there, all right? Let's say at night it was 10 degrees Celsius, and at the heat of the day it's 20 degrees. I wish it was like that right now, but it's not, all right? So could you say that it's twice as hot during the day than at night? Can you say that? 10 degrees versus 20 degrees? Yeah, okay. Right? Makes sense. If it was negative 10 degrees and negative 5 degrees, could you say that we were twice as hot? And then again, if it was negative 5 degrees versus 5 degrees, do you say one was twice as hot? There's no meaningful zero on those scales. There's no starting point. So we can't really set up a ratio to say it's twice as hot or it's three times as hot. Sometimes it works. Sometimes we, get, we can work if we arbitrarily define that meaningful zero. But along the entire scale, you, you can't do that. Ratios, you can. So discrete, offspring, number of offspring in the clutch. Our meaningful zero, or our meaningful zero point is zero. You have zero offspring. And then if you compare having two offspring to having four offspring, you can say we've had twice as many offspring. All right? We have a meaningful zero point. Heights, our meaningful zero point is zero. We can't ever go to negative, uh, negative height. So you might say, is all temperature an interval scale? What about Kelvin? Kelvin has a meaningful zero point. And then you can convert Fahrenheit and Celsius to the Kelvin scale. Yeah, then you can work with ratio scales, but not Celsius or Fahrenheit. Uh, intelligence yeah, with the IQ scores. That's an interval. There really is no meaningful zero point for that. Questions on this? All right, practice. Tell you what, so we're gonna we're gonna do this. We've got shirt size, zip code, distance between cities, standardized test scores, leaves on a bush grade as a letter grade, grade as a percentage, time to complete a task, and then a ratio of measurement variables, which is in this case, I'm gonna say surface area to volume ratios. What we want to do is define is describe the type and the scale of each of these variables. Alright. So, shirt size. What do you say? And to avoid complications, we're talking about shirt size on a t-shirt. Small, medium, large, XL, double XL, maybe extra small. So, what's that? Qualitative. Why, Why would you say qualitative? It's descriptive. Yeah, it's an attribute. Descriptive. Would you say it's nominal or ordinal? I'd say it's ordinal. I think it has an implied ordering that as you move up the scale, it gets larger. All right. Zip code. Qualitative. Why would you say qualitative? Okay, a descriptor of an area. All right. Would you consider it ordinal or nominal? Nominal. Nominal. All right. Don't mess that up. A lot of people think zip codes are like continuous. No, they're, they're just a label. Is there any order? Is, is 76909, which is ASU, is that better than 76901, which is like Lake Beaver? No. It's just, a, just an area. It's just a classification. Distance between cities. So just distance between here and San Antonio. Nominal. Is it qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative. And then what's the scale? Quantitative. We can measure that, right? Ratio or interval? What's that? Interval? Yeah, I'd say ratio. Can't really have negative distance. It'd be zero. Our, me our meaningful zero point is zero. We're kind of bounded by that. So, yeah, I, that's a ratio. And, and there, again, the ratio is 
if we can utilize ratio between numbers and they're consistent across the entire scale. So twice as, as distant holds true regardless where you're at on the scale. That's, that's our ratio. Standardized test scores. So MCAT, GRE, IQs. Quantitative, it is measured. You have to understand the, the scores. So it's, this one's an interval. There's really no meaningful zero. There's always, you always get points. I guess it, if you submitted the exam without filling it out, I guess it just gets keyed as incomplete. But. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know what the lowest IQ recorded is. So, it, yeah, like 40 is the, yeah, it's it's tough tough to say. And that's kind of what the MCAT and GRE, there's, they kind of scale up based on who, who took it. Leaves on a bush. Quantitative. What kind of quantitative? Would you say discrete or continuous? Discrete. That's a discrete. So don't think too hard on it. It either has the leaf or it doesn't have the leaf. We're not going to say, well, part of it's missing because an insect chewed it off or because the water off my roof is damaging all my leaves. Don't, it's, the leaf is there or it's not. So, yeah, it's it's discrete. And I should do that same thing with the distance between cities. Would you say continuous or discrete? Yeah, it's continuous. We can go finer and finer and finer. Uh, grade, letter grades? Say you qualitative ordering. Order. Yeah, I'd say there's some order. Uh, difference between an A and B is not the same, or it doesn't need to be the same difference. Just difference between a D and an F, right? Percentage grade. Yeah, I'd say it's continuous. So we can have unlimited decimal points. Uh, interval or ratio? Is there a meaningful zero? Yeah, now there might be some faculty that, that would like a negative scale, but we're bounded by zero. All right, we're bounded by zero. Uh, time to complete a task. How long would it take to do the homework? All right, we, we time it. How long does it take to do the exam? We time it. Continuous or discrete? Yeah, continuous. It depends on how fine we get for that timing. Interval or ratio? Yeah, definitely. Can't have a negative time. Ratio of measurement variable. So surface area to volume ratios. Elijah, take a stab at it. Oh, I mean, that's quantitative. Yep, continuous or discrete? Just think, can we keep going decimal, more and more decimal places? Yeah. Yep, all right. Uh, interval or ratio? Probably ratio. I'm sorry, interval. You say interval, you say ratio. Who's correct? Ratio. We can't have a negative. Can we have a zero? We have to be careful with, with something. Surface area to volume is actually interval because we can't ever have a zero surface area or a zero volume. Now, you can say, well, we're bounded by it, but think about it. If we have a, yeah, we have a zero surface area, your volume is going to be a zero. And can you have a zero in the denominator? Violate math, right? That's a trick question, but th something to think about. So, all right, we're going to stop here, and I'm going to give you a preview. It, exam number one, you're going to have to do it. So I'll give you give you variables. I actually tell you what to put in each column. So qualitative, discrete, continuous, and then the second column is the scale. So nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio.
look over this. Plenty more examples out there. Uh, we'll pick this up. Oh, look at that. Ooh. David. David is just typing in his answers in chat. Cool. Yeah, uh, no class on Monday, Labor Day, three day weekend. Um, we'll pick this up on Wednesday. Uh, there will be a quiz coming up. Uh, the quiz will be in class. It'll be a short half page. Uh, I'd start reviewing like definitions and kind of reviewing this stuff. So I'll have a quiz kind of up to this point. And then our next quiz will be what's coming up here, which is rounding and stuff. So again, my daughter did rounding in elementary school. I know you've rounded, so it should be easy. It should be easy. Hopefully we get through it.